last year, but with my wife, we're going to knock out Alzheimer's again. So. So you'll see in a minute uh, images of her with boxing gloves last year. So I had the distinct pleasure of welcoming all of you today to the 2017 National Alzheimer's Summit. For many of you, I get to welcome you to our nation's capital, the entertainment capital of the world. Uh, <laughs> Some, some of you have traveled great distances to be here. Some took a metro or drove. A few even walked. Thank you for being here. Some of you left behind pressing matters at the office. Some of you have wanted eagerly, waited eagerly for months to connect with others. Some of you are here despite great challenges at home, including caring for a loved one with a disease. Thank you for being here. Some of you are personal donors and members of the host committee. Some of you represent our generous sponsors who help underwrite this event and ensure it gets better every year. Thank you for being here. Some of you are familiar faces and great friends from summits in the past and work between summits in the past. And what we have built together is coming together in now in an Alzheimer's movement. Some of you are new. I'm delighted to walk the next part of the path with all of you. Thank you for being here. Uh, let me, I just want to thank our generous donors uh, who make this summit uh, possible. Eli Lilly has been a champion uh, of fighting against this disease, but also supporting this organization since almost its beginning. Uh, uh, Manny Friedman and his family uh, have been supporters for years. Connected Living, a new friend, uh, and Sarah Hoyt, uh, her network of uh, individuals and companies uh, are new, but thank her. Uh, Jansen, again, uh, like Lily, has been a supporter since almost the beginning of the organization. And our platinum sponsors, uh, a number of companies and uh, NGOs, and uh, Home Instead, a, a professional care company, thank you. Uh, so, uh, whoever you are, from wherever you are, uh, I want to thank you and uh, thrilled to have you here. So I uh, would like to welcome you as well on behalf of our board of directors, uh, many of whom are here. Um, John Dwyer, Sean Taylor, I don't know, Sean Taylor's right here in the front row, Karen Siegel, uh, Karen Siegel, uh, Meryl Comer, Peter Levin, uh, Greg O'Brien, and for some reason, Jill Lesser is not on. There she is. She's on. We have two organizations. This is a little too complex. But we started as a C4 because we were oriented to political action. We subsequently started a C3 because of most of what we do is educational and philanthropic. Uh, so we have actually two technical organizations, and we sp split the leaders of the organization. Um, Yesterday's, uh, I, many of you were at yesterday's uh, uh, disparities convening, and it was really emotionally draining because of the stories told by caregivers and those with dementia, uh, and intellectually nutritious because there was a lot of very interesting content on how it is that we can uh, make sure that we serve communities of color as well as the general communities. The most striking thing that I have uh, heard in the recent months is that by 2030, uh, the majority of Americans with this disease will be communities of color. And so that means we're going to be majority minority by 2030 uh, as far as the dementia community is concerned. And we're now testing medicines in white populations. Uh, we're basically going to be serving white populations or at least populations at the upper end of the social demographic curve because Medicare is likely, at least initially, to be resistant to reimbursing for these diseases. So it's going to be mostly private pay at the outset. And that just isn't tolerable. We have to fight to make sure that innovative medicines and support for caregivers uh, is for all American families affected by this disease uh, and not just um, uh, those who can afford private pay uh, or those in whom medicines are being tested. So finding ways to serve communities of color has been a core element of the mission of this organization from the get-go. 
and Jason Resendez, who heads our Latino network, and uh, Stephanie Monroe, who heads our African American network, have been extraordinary and fierce and hardworking in making uh, uh, this uh, increasingly possible. So I want to thank all of you who are here. This is, notwithstanding the size of this summit, which is about twice the size of last year, uh, still a small group. And you represent uh, to us the core of what makes us tick. Uh, we have always been advocates uh, for change, uh, both change on the part of government and change on the part of business and change on the part of the care industry. Uh, but we also, as Gandhi would say, we have to be the change uh, that uh, we want to see in the world. So we are advocates, but we're also change agents. And so this group is defined by vision, uh, by forward-looking action, <clears throat> and relentless hard work. And we come together around the theme that we use this year, which is uniting communities for a cure. Anyone who knows us against Alzheimer's knows we carry a determination in all we do. It's truly a labor of love, love for our families, our own families, those that have continue uh, to experience this disease, those that have passed away as a result of this disease. It's a, it's, a, it's a labor of passion and purpose. So most of us came to this work because of loved ones, and that's true, of course, in my case, as uh, uh, with others, uh, because of my wife's mother and grandmother who died of this disease, uh, and the shared uh, purpose of my wife uh, and her family. <laughs> Uh, she drove me. Uh, she drove me with determination, but with extraordinary humor. Uh, and uh, in April, I lost uh, my love of my life, um, uh, ironically, to a heart attack. Uh, and it was only last year at this time that she stood in front of you with those same boxing gloves uh, to knock out Alzheimer's. And her fighting spirit, her sense of humor, her sense of purpose, her sense of optimism expressed in a quote that she favored uh, really uh, infuses me every day. It infuses our organization every day. And I hope that it will continue to infuse uh, the movement uh, around, uh, around Alzheimer's. I want to share a video that uh, I haven't seen it, actually, recorded of Trish not too long ago when we were in North Carolina with Alice Watkins, who I saw here somewhere this morning. Alice Watkins from North Carolina, uh, when we were down there in North Carolina with the governor uh, reading a, uh, uh, the first act of Trisha's play, Surviving Grace. My mother, who was this lioness of a woman, I mean, she, she got to Kennedy's inaugural, he invited her because she won the state for him. That's the kind of woman my mom was. And all of a sudden, she was unraveling. And so began our journey with her with Alzheimer's. And I watched her as she vanished, disappeared, and dropped into the chasm of Alzheimer's. In 1992, when she died, I found I couldn't let go. So I had to get it down on paper, how it was with my mom. And this, this strong woman who was so strong she could run both lives, hers and mine, um, all of a sudden couldn't run anything. And I found I had to not only not let go, but I had to keep going with the story as I saw it work out. So I made it into, by act two, a fantasy where she comes back from medication. How many women would give anything to have their mother back? When you think of it, I'm giving you a gift. Okay, so here we are 20 years later, from, from when, more than that, from when my mom died, and nothing really has changed. And so four years ago, my divine husband, uh, George, and I started Us Against Alzheimer's because we're convinced you need a little rowdiness. You need someone who will go, come on, we gotta get this done. We've gotta raise money, we've gotta raise awareness. We've gotta take this where AIDS took it. And AIDS was in a shadow, in a closet, and when they came out, when they demanded 
that attention be paid, that happened. And now it's, it's a manageable disease. It's amazing because that community made it happen. Well, that's what this community has to do, Alzheimer's community. But the difference is that they can't talk for themselves. So we have to be their witnesses. We have to shout and say, pay attention to us. We're 550,000 dying a year, and we're 5.4 million people who have this. This is a tsunami coming. Us Against Alzheimer's is devoted to making it stop, make, getting, getting money for research, and getting awareness so, so that people know just how important it is. continue to fight. Okay, okay, this is going to be hard this morning. Um, um, both uh, several senators last night spoke about the enduring legacy of Trish. I think Marky said she's our North Star in terms of what we want to accomplish. Uh, Susan Collins said that she had an enduring legacy to solve this disease and to commit to it. So let me just say, what are our values? So we're determined, we're action oriented, uh, we're passionate. Uh, we are collaborative, and we are laser-focused on a cure and making sure that those with this disease and their caregivers have the support they need until we get there. Um, because the us and us against Alzheimer's is so core to who we are, we have actually have some vignettes uh, from some of us, uh, uh, which we'll play now. Uh, you might recognize this phrase, but this is, this is us. <laughs> Hello, I'm Greg O'Brien, a board member for Us Against Alzheimer's and author of On Pluto, Inside the Mind of Alzheimer's, the first book written by an investigative reporter embedded inside the mind of Alzheimer's, chronicling the progression of his own disease, a disease that stole my maternal grandfather, my mother, my father, and my paternal uncle. And now Alzheimer's has come for me. I take this personally, and yes, I have to read from my notes. What motivates me in the us in this fight? For without a critical mass of research, funding, vision, and care, yes, the simplest of all, without love, we will not meet the current goal of slaying this demon Alzheimer's. That's what I want you to know, that together, arm in arm, soul in soul, we can win this battle. I'm in the fight for my children and grandchildren, and for you, your children and grandchildren. Let's face it, the train is left for me. But if, if the us in us against Alzheimer's prevails, if the faith and hope endures, then the journey for me will be worth it. Let's fight. God bless you. Hi, I'm Loretta Vini, one of the co-moderators of the Us Against Alzheimer's Community Facebook support group. The one thing I wish people knew about Alzheimer's is the first time your loved one forgets who you are is the worst day of your life. Hi, my name is Jackie Mark and I'm the Outreach and Advocacy Manager for Alzheimer's Orange County in California. I became an Alzheimer's advocate four years ago as a professional opportunity to give a voice to those who don't have one. Unfortunately, what was once a professional connection became very personal in 2015 when my grandmother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. Now more than ever, we have to come together as one voice to advocate for more care, support, and funding for research so that we can get rid of this awful disease. I cannot wait to advocate in Washington, D.C. in 2017 with Us Against Alzheimer's at the annual summit. Thank you for being an Alzheimer's advocate. Greetings from Tuscaloosa, Alabama on this World Alzheimer's Day. I'm Dr. Daniel Potts. And I'm Ellen Woodward Potts. And we're from Cognitive Dynamics Foundation and Faith United Against Alzheimer's. 
We are the us in Us Against Alzheimer's because between the two of us and our two immediate families, we have cared for eight family members who had either Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia. So we're passionate about this cause. We're passionate about supporting cure. We're passionate about educating people on effective preventions for dementia. We're passionate about honoring the personhood and spiritual health of individuals who have Alzheimer's and other dementias. And we're passionate about supporting caregivers and families in any way that we can. Roll, Roll Tide! tide. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lee Callahan and I'm a caregiver for my husband who struggles every day with Alzheimer's disease. I am highly enthusiastic about Us Against Alzheimer's for their enduring commitment to accelerating what can be done in terms of drug development and also for their commitment to bringing this illness out of the shadows. Alzheimer's disease has enormous impact on the individuals who deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. Not only the patients, but also the families and the caregivers. Thanks, Us Against Alzheimer's, for all you do. So, uh, we are premised on the belief that with enough will, a political will and the will of the people of the United States, uh, that we can cure this disease that we can pressure government to provide more resource, to set the policy environment that will encourage more investment. Uh, we can work with industry to uh, accelerate their efforts to identify barriers to getting medicines to market faster, uh, that we can work with NGOs around here and around the world uh, to combine the voices, so which we've done so effectively in leaders engaged in Alzheimer's disease under the extraordinary leadership of Ian Kremer, with 90 Alzheimer's-serving organizations now united in a common voice uh, to speak for all of this community. So as you can see from this chart, and I may not be able to read it all, we have really six really pillars of what we want to do. We want to mobilize Americans to demand a cure through increased research uh, investments and elimination of barriers uh, to uh, getting uh, medicines uh, to market. Uh, we want to increase the speed, efficiency, and quality and diversity of uh, clinical trials. Uh, we want to uh, uh, get earlier and better diagnoses and treatments uh, for those with the disease. We, in it, we now diagnose late, we diagnose wrong, and as a consequence, when medicines come to market, we're not going to know who should be getting those medicines. Uh, we want to uh, get the patient and caregiver voice into all the decisions with respect to clinical trial design, with respect to regulatory approvals, with respect to uh, decisions by CMS to reimburse for these drugs. So we have a new initiative to get patient voice into all those decisions. We want to be active and articulate in setting national care goals uh, to get the industry that serves uh, those individuals, for-profit and non-profit, uh, to extend the quality of their work and to extend it into the communities and want to support family caregivers to make sure that the backbone of care in the society is supported uh, through respite uh, and other support mechanisms. Uh, and quite frankly, we want to make sure this is done for all Americans and not just, as I said before, whites. Women who are two-thirds of the victims and two-thirds of the caregivers, African Americans who are two to three times as likely as whites to get the disease, and Latinos who are one and a half times as likely as non-Latino whites. So real fast, you all have a book so you know what the day is going to look like, but we intend to thread through this day sort of elements this is based upon your comments last year, elements of what our policy asks are going to be tomorrow. So all of this, as we explained at the beginning, at the end of each of these panels, will inform you on what it is that you are going to be informed about by panelists and what the panelists just said that will support the policy asks uh, that we uh, will uh, do tomorrow. If we're going to turn to how do you build a movement, you know, quite frankly, we are so many Americans, virtually every family, will say that they or a family they know have been affected by the disease. So there's an enormous awareness of the disease. But yet that voice has not been uh, as strong and as powerful as you might say the AIDS movement has, as my wife cited, uh, or as the breast cancer movement, or as other major movements against other diseases. So what turns all this latent power uh, in the Alzheimer's and dementia community into real capacity to build a movement? 
We will talk about the social and economic impacts of this disease with some new analysis done by Nick Eberstadt of AEI. Uh, we'll turn to exactly what's happening in the pipeline. When can we expect new medicines? What do they look like? What are their potential power? Uh, are they a solution? Are they a path to a solution? Uh, and our lunch speaker, Bill Novelli, who is, uh, uh, has been in the advertising advocacy and media business for a long time, is going to speak to us about this. After lunch, we'll turn to early detection and diagnosis. As I said before, if we don't know who's got the disease at an early stage, we're not going to get medicines to them at the right time and the stage of the disease to actually prevent it uh, or at least slow it down. And then brain health and prevention. What can we do now uh, to actually defer uh, the symptoms of this disease? And then we're going to talk uh, at the end of the day about innovations on a cure. Uh, just one last thing. This weekend, after tomorrow afternoon, I fly to Los Angeles where there's an Alzheimer's X Prize team that will be competing uh, in a sort of competitive pitch meeting uh, to get the X Prize Foundation to adopt Alzheimer's uh, as a major X Prize. We have a team of individuals uh, led by myself and Ken Dykewald and Lisa Genova, uh, and so we are going to go pitch. Uh, and if we advance, and we'll know by Sunday, this is unbelievable, 250 people coming through, listening to our pitch all day Friday and all day Saturday, and Saturday night is closing arguments, and by, uh, by Sunday morning, we're going to know whether we advance uh, or democracy now advances. Obama is going to put in a video on that, so this is not late competition. Uh, Industrial mining without creating any waste, cleaning up the oceans, it's, you know, it's just your normal weekend in Los Angeles. <laughs> um, but, uh, this X Prize is intended to uh, give a prize of $10 million uh, to whomever comes up with the measure that is predictive of your getting uh, this disease. Uh, and uh, that measure being actionable, that is, it will trigger uh, new targets uh, for this disease uh, before, before your symptoms appear. So that's the prize. Uh, it's uh, going to be an effort, obviously, uh, but one of the members of our team has pledged $25 million as a starter against this. $10 million for the prize, $15 million for operations. So we're off and running. So it's a video from... Uh, the Alzheimer's Brain Trust, which includes me and Ken Dykewald, it also includes John Dwyer and Merrill Comer uh, and Simone Friedman, the Friedman families. Uh, but this is a, a, little, a little video of Ken Dykewald, is sort of my partner and the lead of this team. <clears throat> I'm Ken Dykewald. I'm a psychologist, a gerontologist, and the CEO of AgeWave. As we all know, we're in the midst of an incredible longevity revolution. In fact, two-thirds of all the people who have ever lived past 65 in the entire history of the world are alive today. But we're also seeing the birth of a horrible, horrific, terrible Alzheimer's pandemic worldwide that could be the social and emotional and physical sinkhole of the 21st century. We have joined together with the XPRIZE Foundation to develop an idea for an Alzheimer's XPRIZE that would crowdsource innovation from all over the world, from physicists, from neuroscientists, from brain hackers, from security experts, from high school kids in, uh, in classes thinking that they have the answer to analyzing data. Our goal would be to find an ideal biotarget that is actionable and through that to unleash breakthroughs to end this disease in the next several years. Update, working with George Vradenberg these last five years has been one of the great experiences of my life. We built a team of over 100 leading scientists from all over the world and institutions from every corner of the world have decided they want to play with us and try to break this disease in this fashion. We've also raised the money. Just last week we raised $25 million to fund our initiative, Should We Win? And that's the last thing. This weekend we're going to be competing in Southern California with other teams in other categories to see if our Alzheimer's X Prize can be launched into the world. Wish us luck. Good luck, Ken. <clears throat> It gives me great pleasure to introduce my daughter, Alyssa Vredenberg, <laughs> arriving late, having to get her Starbucks uh, with my daughter-in-law, Janine Vredenberg, so thank you for coming. <laughs> you missed your mother. <laughs> <laughs>
We'll play it for you later. It, it gives me now a really great pleasure to introduce my partner in all of this. Uh, there are four people that founded this organization, Trish and myself, John Dwyer, and Merrill Comer. Uh, and we have been together for years uh, working on this, initially raising money for the Alzheimer's Association and then starting this organization in 2010. Uh, and John, uh, who is a serial entrepreneur in the space, in the healthcare space, uh, has taken on the task of the presidency of the Global Alzheimer's Platform Foundation, which I chair, uh, and uh, is charged with the virtually impossible task with a very small staff and not enough money of actually transforming the Alzheimer's clinical trial system to make it faster, less expensive, uh, and with higher quality. And he has done that with enormous skill and enormous hard work, and he hasn't been home in about six months, but uh, he, is, uh, he has proven not only to be a great friend, which he is, but also a talented executive and sort of entrepreneur in the social space. John, thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. And uh, my thanks to George and Sally and uh, the uh, Us Against Alzheimer's team for uh, giving me an opportunity to say a few words. Uh, my father, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my father died of Alzheimer's. My grandmother died of Alzheimer's. Prior to my father, four of his sisters died of Alzheimer's. After my father, one brother and one sister died of Alzheimer's. Uh, three of uh, his siblings did not die of Alzheimer's and one's still living and looks like uh, she will not succumb to the disease. So as my good friend uh, Ron would say, uh, I prob Ron Peterson would say I'm probably at risk. Now my 81 cousins, because we are Irish Catholic, uh, <coughs> also are at risk and their 140 children are also at risk. So uh, I represent a fairly large constituency all by myself of folks that are motivated to find a solution for the disease. George, I want to thank you for those opening remarks. But my father, who I've already told you about, used to say, you never want an introduction that sounds more like your obituary. So <laughs> thank you for your kind remarks, but I plan to be here for a while. Uh, so let me say a few words about what GAP is all about. Uh, and then I'd like to just quickly, because I promised Sally uh, we would be quick, uh, tell you about our learnings from the last year and uh, make a couple announcements about where we're headed uh, on a go-forward basis, one policy observation. Uh, GAP, as George outlined, uh, has the not unambitious goal of uh, trying to do three things at once, uh, reduce the average time of phase two, three trial duration in therapeutic trials by two years. And I look at all my sponsor colleagues, and you can say that's you know, somewhere between eight and 10 years from, uh, for phase two, three in combination. So uh, it's not an unambitious goal. Huge consequences to that, both in terms of finding therapy sooner as also uh, the cost consequences, because if industry and the NIA have more capital to, uh, uh, because duration shorter, they can do more trials. Uh, we have already, when we looked at the problem, and we took uh, a very orthogonal approach to this problem, because uh, speaking for myself, I didn't know that much about uh, clinical trials at this level. I'd only done two in my prior, uh, uh, my prior uh, companies. Uh, we saw, here's the good news. There's 101 trials minimum in the pipeline. People argue higher or lower, but at least 101. As you grow, everything in this business is, you grow something, something else becomes the constraint. It's a pure process. By the way, in my remarks, if I say one thing scientific, it's unintended. Gap, gap is in a science-free perspective. How do we go about this thing, make more sense of it as a process problem, and let the science fall out, but optimize the process? So, uh, uh, now we've got 101 uh, therapeutic trials between the NIA and industry, and guess what? The infrastructure of the science community, uh, better known as the clinical trial site community, didn't keep up. And now you're looking at the, uh, this, this 
surplus, quotes around surplus, of therapeutic trials, and they're all uh, trying to squeeze through the same pipe that uh, previously was doing much fewer trials than a decade ago. So uh, looking at capacity, looking at recruiting, those were the two biggest problems we uh, faced as we started to look at this thing from a, a process improvement uh, point of view. And I'll talk a little bit about what our learnings are. The third element is, and one of the reasons we were created, was to partner with our friends at uh, ATRI, Risa Sperling at Brigham's and Women's, and Jeff Cummings at uh, Cleveland Clinic, Lou Ruvo in Vegas, who, thank God, is fine. And their whole team is fine, by the way. Uh, and there uh, we submitted, uh, they submitted an R01 for, which is NIA speak for a large grant for $25 million, $5 million a year for five years to create a trial ready cohort. So if you think about that, recruiting's a big problem. You want to create a trial ready cohort of patients that would be appropriate, characterized, and ready to go into trials and match it up with a trial ready network of high performing sites. Uh, uh, that couldn't do tri trials better and more, uh, more quickly than anyone else in the field, uh, and put those things together and you start to get a theoretical super uh, performance characteristic to the way therapies might be pursued in the future. That R01 grant was awarded in May of this year. We're just now starting the planning process. Uh, and we're very, very uh, pleased that the NIA saw fit to let us undertake that as a partner with them in that. And so that's one of our big accomplishments for the year. And has a lot to do with the support and funding we've received from our pharma sponsors and philanthropic sponsors uh, uh, because it gave the credibility to the endeavor that it required. Uh, so let me just go through a list just because uh, I promised Sally I would be uh, uncharacteristically short. Here's what we've learned, and I'm happy to talk to any of you about uh, some of this in, uh, in detail, but number one, after we went through this last year and a half, uh, there's something called Hanlon's Razor, which basically says, if you see something wrong, uh, don't attribute malice when stupidity is sufficient. That's not true about pharma, so I didn't want pharma to think I said it meant that. I would change Hanlon's razor to say, do, do not attribute to stupidity what uh, uh, unquestioning adherence to precedent can explain. So we did it this way last year, so that's why we're going to do it again this year. And sometimes that's just not the best way to go about the business. So the second thing we learned is um, not all resources are the same, and not all sites are the same, and there's such a huge difference between academic sites, that is, sites that are part of great commercial, uh, academic centers, and the private sites that are a, a standalone business that do clinical trials, and to think that one size fits all is enormously mistaken. So we have gone about trying to customize our uh, approach to get great results recognizing that resources and process have to be optimized uh, accordingly. I want to say a couple things about minority recruitment, but most importantly, we worked with Jason and Stephanie this year with enormously constructive results. Uh, they talked about it yesterday. Uh, I won't go through all that, but there's uh, perhaps the thing I'm most proud about today, this morning, are two pieces of paper. The first is a little blue one-pager, which if Jason or Stephanie are around, I know it'll be passed around, where they showed what we accomplished in one year, all these different uh, tactics. There's Jason. And I encourage you to look at that, because what is foundational the way we look at the world is you create demand to get into trials. But as participants, as patient advocates, it is ethically unacceptable to not do something with those folks and get them down to a, an action that they can take to advance the energy you've now released. They now become seekers, they become eager to get uh, involved. And so in every community where we're doing this kind of minority outreach, we also say those underrepresented populations, and here you go. This is all about community. Here's a site right here. Here's the trials they have. This PI wants to meet you. So we are connecting demand, the demand we create to the supply on the ground. 
And that's a little unusual to just hook all that together and consistently do that. So that's what we call cadence. The biggest difference between us and any uh, pharma company or any NIA trial is they have a natural sign curve of activity. They ramp up to recruit for a trial, the trial gets enrolled, they uh, ramp down. This is foundational. What we do is we pump energy into every market we're in, trying to create that community's awareness so we can improve recruiting and get resources to the sites, whether there are resources or community resources, to make them better. Three other things. We have already uh, been uh, given a gift by our sites, a gift that uh, we trust uh, is going to be as important as it has been in the first year, and that is we now have the largest data uh, view of what the American trial site capacity is for Alzheimer's of anyone in the country. That sounds pretty audacious, right? But if you think about it, it makes sense. Every one of our sites is reporting all their trials to us. In an anonymized, but all their trials to us. We know how many they're doing, how many people they've got to screen, how many randomizations they've done per quarter. No CRO has that information because they only know about that site based on the trials that they had within that CRO. No sponsor has that information. They only know what the uh, particular trials they were doing. So now we can offer the field of, hey, you guys really think we have enough capacity or you want to see what, how much more we need to do to get capacity? We can now measure those challenges. And then we can start working against those challenges to solutions. We're very excited about the data. The other thing we've learned is in participant recruiting on data, this is, going to, this is a volatile question. I don't pretend to, I want to answer it right now. But the field has got to figure out what we're going to tell participants about data. Beta amyloid positivity, if you've all heard about it, what does that mean? You know, one trial you might not be, uh, be included because your beta amyloid is too low. Another trial you're included because that had a different cutoff. Now we have tau. Tau is going to be similarly challenging because the rate, you know, what a tau level means and what is it actually is moving around. The field is raw in terms of being able to uh, convey information to participants about what those things mean. EPOE4, positively. Uh, are you heterogeneous? Are you homogeneous? Uh, are really important discussion points. And the only thing I want this audience to know is our data is showing increasingly it's not going to be acceptable based on what we're seeing if sponsors, the NIA, and trialists don't want to share that data. There's, you know, the, the baby boom generation is going to be our next wave of participants, and we see this insatiable need to know what the consequences of their measures are. Let's just give them choice is our end point. If they don't want to know, don't tell them. If they do want to know, tell them. That'd be our first. Uh, we have been asked by many, so you can know, uh, you know, what is GAP? GAP. Uh, is not a CRO, we're not, that means contract research organization, we're not an SMO, site marketing organization. Right now we're just uh, a G JGSD, just get stuff done. Let's just get stuff done. We'll figure out the rest on the back end. And last but not least uh, about our report for the year uh, is uh, a profound appreciation uh, at, uh, across the country for the dedication of the researchers, because they are extraordinarily dedicated. Uh, the, uh, the commitment and ethical uh, concerns they voice and present about our well-being in trials is extraordinarily high and reassures me about the, our hope for finding a therapy. Similarly, and they're here, many of them, uh, uh, I've been in big corporations, didn't last very long for reasons that may be self-evident, but uh, uh, I am overwhelmed with a similar characteristic of uh, the big pharma partners in their adherence to high ethical standards, their love of our, the patients, and their uh, desire to do the right thing. So those are two great wins. There is a problem, we're going to address it at GAP, which is uh, good manners. Not that anybody means to be uh, ill-spoken or rude, but Sites can't ask participants to wait three months before they get reviewed for a trial. 
The NIA shouldn't accept that. Sp sponsors shouldn't accept that. Telephone calls should be returned. Uh, because once they're in a trial, they're treated very well. But that front end experience, not so great. So we will be reporting next year on how to upgrade that, per that personal front end experience. Last but not least, because I did say we had uh, a couple uh, announcements. We are uh, very pleased to report that uh, you have a, a refrigerator magnet in your bag for our Activate Brain Health Program. That's a little different than what Jill said uh, is, uh, uh, it, Jill will be talking about as a national program. That brain health program is incredibly important to our uh, recruiting initiative. We have about uh, nine employers who've expressed a uh, keen interest in, and commercial health plans have expressed a keen interest in making that available. And uh, we are undertaking a, a new clinical site development program. Uh, we can announce the first one already. There's a new site going to be opened up here in Washington, in Virginia. It's probably the most uh, productive European owner of clinical trial sites is coming into Washington. And we will, she, we, she is going to become uh, our, in our network. And so I can say with great pride that we probably will be able to increase the throughput in this part of the city by 10, 15% with that one site. So we're quite pleased to announce that. Thank you, everyone.